Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Lecture Series. Sit back, get comfortable, and let's go see what they have for us today. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another of the uh, Wednesday morning lecture programs brought to you by Peninsula Seniors. We're delighted to have you all here, and I'm even more uh, delighted to be able to bring some very old friends of mine who have discovered bird watching, and they did it right here on the peninsula about 16 years ago when they wandered around George F. Canyon, which is here in Rolling Hills Estates. And so uh, they've made an enormous uh, commitment and career almost uh, of bird watching. And so without any further ado, I want to introduce Donna and Fred Niedemeyer. Well, I get to start. I'm Donna. This is Fred. Uh, we've lived on the peninsula 40 years now. The house is paid for. We're staying. Uh, we want to share with you today something that started out as a passing interest, uh, quickly became more than a passing interest. We attended a, uh, there are many cities throughout the United States who have uh, bird festivals now. And I just noticed a little blurb in the paper that said the Salton Sea Birding Festival. We spent three glorious days birding down there, meeting all kinds of people from everywhere. And that was it. It became our passion and uh, will be for the rest of our lives. In fact, uh, all three of our sons-in-law are birders. Uh, several of our daughters, now our grandson is getting into it. So it's really special. Uh, it's given us a reason to travel far and wide. We'll share a little bit of that with you. To meet some terrific new friends, you'll see a little of that. And to see a lot of people around the world in a very different setting, not really as a tourist, out in the jungle or tromping through the whatever. So um, is there anybody here who shares uh, actual are birders? Oh, good, good. Maybe when we have you a leave. Bird photographer. Over yes, there. we do have some photos that somebody brought. Okay, so we hope to get you at least a little interested. Um, we're called birders in England. They're called twitchers, and they actually are people who will uh, hear of a rare bird and they want to put it on their list so they will travel 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 to see this rare bird and check it off their list tick 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 so and then it became a, a verb we bird so it's uh, it's an amazing hobby an estimated 61 million people were birders in the late 1980s in North America it's grown it's a fast-growing hobby can you guess how much money was spent in the economy in, in 2001, I believe, was the last I could buy? $32 billion. And that is amazing. And that results in travel and hotels and equipment and who knows what all. But I just found that astounding. So as an introduction, that was it. And now I'm going to let Fred go. Hi. You know, um, <clears throat> if you've peeked at the handout there, uh, how, to, how to get started, you probably think we want to convert you all into bird watchers today. That's, that's not really true. But in case any of you, a couple of you, say, see something you think, gee, I'd like to try that, there's a little how-to guide there that we can talk a little bit about more later. Um, it did, that salt and sea experience was, was a good start, but the, the one in George F. Canyon, I think, really lit my fires because, you know, we, we see birds every day and already, yeah, and we sort of ignore them and they're not very interesting anyway. In fact, some of them are a nuisance. The three people already have come up to me and asked, so how do we get rid of crows? And, you know, and you see the little house sparrows picking up your hamburger crumbs at, uh, at McDonald's and you see, gulls and you know these little sparrows in your backyard they're not very colorful and they're fine but you know why why be a bird watcher and i think our point today is and we're going to show you some of these that the, we have two kind two sets of slides the first one every year um 
these wonderful little colorful, unbelievably looking birds migrate right through here on their way north to breed up in Canada and Oregon and Alaska. And that happens in late April and most of May. And you just will not believe what's in the trees all over the peninsula in those weeks. In fact, out front here along Crenshaw, no, along Hawthorne, you have about five of those um, Australian, what are they called? Um, coral, we call coral them coral trees, trees. That have the bright red flowers in April and May. Perfect. Most, many of these birds I'm gonna show you, they're in those trees in those weeks. You'd never know it if you don't look up and look for them. But I get excited, maybe because I'm partly colorblind, but I get excited seeing very colorful birds. They really light me up. And one day, when to start this, we were in George F. Canyon maybe 15 years ago, and uh, we were near the end of the hike, and we hadn't seen a whole lot, but suddenly Don and I heard this, uh, this call. I'll play it for you. My little bird pod thing has about 600 bird calls on it. So we heard this. It's called the witchity witchity call. And we turned around and we saw this bird in the bush behind us just singing away to the world. And it was this um, common yellow throat, it's called, with a black Lone Ranger mask and a white head and a yellow, bright, bright yellow body. Most of these pictures don't do any justice to how brightly colored these birds are. And we couldn't believe, you know, after looking at sparrows and stuff all day, that there was a bird like this. And there's a, there are a lot more. This is one of our favorite birds, uh, called the Western Tanager. He's about the size of a robin, and he'll be in those coral trees in late April and May. I've seen him in the eucalyptus trees right down in the mall in, uh, in Rolling Hills. There are two kinds of orioles. There's the hooded oriole and the bullock's oriole, and they're in these trees, and they're very bright and colorful. You may have seen some of these birds, and you wondered what they were, but they're, they're so different from the dull ones that come through. In fact, this or these orioles nest down in Harbor Park by the lake, and they're up in the palm trees, and you will see them fly, feeding their young back and forth. It's spectacular. There's a, a whole species of birds, the yellow throat was part of it, called warblers. And warblers are these tiny little very colorful birds. We have, there's about 35 of them in the U.S. Most are in the east, but we have about 10 of them come through California and PV. And this is a Townsend's warbler. And they're just very uh, bright yellow and black streaky birds. There's the tree, the coral tree that you have. Luckily, you have it right here, well, right out front of us. That's a close up. The, they not only, you know, some of the birds will get the nectar out of those flower, trees, uh, flowers, but a lot of birds, uh, like the warblers, they're gleaning, they're walking, they're running around the leaves and branches looking for bugs and caterpillars and stuff to eat. Yellow warbler has little red gion stripes on. We saw our first yellow warbler in the Galapagos Islands. He was probably came up here for the, for the summer. In fact, we've seen yellow warblers in, in Alaska. It's amazing how far some of these birds migrate. This is a um, hermit warbler. With a, he's like the Townsend warbler, but he has a plain yellow face. And he nests in uh, the Cascade Mountains in Oregon. Okay. Now here's an interesting bird. This is the McGilvery's warbler. Notice he has uh, a gray head, okay, and a yellow breast. Very pretty bird. Now let me show you the next bird. He also has a gray head. This is the Nashville warbler. So a big part of birding is, uh, what are we looking at? Now here, you know, it's a gray-headed warbler. There's two, so. so let me do this. Let's see if this works. Look, look right here. He has look the gray right head. Here. Okay. Now go back to the, uh, the other one. Now notice where the gray comes clear down, halfway down his throat, okay? Also look at his eyes. He has two half moon eye rings. It's not a total white eye ring, it's, it's a half moon on the top and the bottom, okay? Now I'll go back to the Nashville warbler. His eye ring is a full circle, 
it's hard to see, but it is. And the main thing is the, the yellow on him comes clear up under his chin. So he got this easy, huh? So you do that all the time in bird watching. It's sort of like, you know, some of, maybe some of you guys have hunted when you were younger. I did with my dad. I would never do it now. But it's sort of the <laughs> idea you go out, you don't know what you're going to see, you find these birds, but instead of shooting them, you check them off on your checklist. More warblers, that's the black and white warbler. He gleans on the uh, trunk and the bark looking for bugs. That's our largest warbler, the, the yellow chat. Chat, 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 chat. Now we're in some other birds. You've probably seen goldfinch all over the country. This is the American goldfinch. He's the brightest. Uh, I'll look at the, you notice he's all yellow on the, right on the back of his neck, and there's no green on him. He's all yellow and black. We don't have very many of those in the peninsula, but we do have a lot of the other goldfinch next the lesser goldfinch. He's not as bright and you'll, he'll always have a green back on his neck rather than yellow. Next. Lots of those, you can attract those with thistle. In your backyard, they'll come to thistle feeders. There are several kinds of gross beaks, we call them. You can see their gross beak up there. They probably eat seeds out of pine cones and stuff. This is a black-headed gross beak. And a blue gross beak. If you and see one of those, you'll be sort of go. <gasps> they are very, very blue, especially when they fly by you. Bluebirds. You've all seen bluebirds in parks, probably. We don't have many western bluebirds in the peninsula, but we do have some that uh, nest up in uh, Ridgecrest School. That's a pair. That's a female. Uh, Notice they're blue, but on the chest, they have this rusty color going down the side of their chest, okay? Now, this next bird is similar, but see if you can tell the difference. This is a lazuli bunting. The, the rust on him is all up at the top. It doesn't run down the sides, and he's more of a bright turquoisey blue on his head. He's a very beautiful bird. How many recognize this bird? The uh, cedar waxwing with his mask. They fly around in flocks and uh, looking for berries. And these trees you have out here over your playground with the dark leaves, we've seen them in there many times in the, at the right time of year, May. These flocks of waxlings will come in and they disappear into those trees eating some kind of round berry thing. Oh, I took this in Newfoundland one winter. I was looking. This is, this is another waxwing, the um, bohemian waxwing. Now imagine seeing this bird in a park, you know. Uh, I find that stunning. And that's a uh, summer tanager. It's a summer tanager. He's all bright red. It's not a cardinal. And uh, they won't be very common here, but always there's one or two that'll summer over in a park in Torrance. And you go to the website and they tell you where they are and you can, you can find them. I like red birds. This is a, a flycatcher, but this is the nicest flycatcher of many. This is a vermilion flycatcher. We also saw that in the Galapagos for mm -hmm. the first time. Mm -hmm. And he'll come to a park in Torrance and spend the summer and he'll sit on the same barbed wire fence and dart out and catch a bug in the air and come back all summer long. He's reliable, beautiful. He took a wrong turn when he was migrating somewhere along the line and ended up over in Long Beach or where. So then he just comes back. Yeah, most of, a lot of these, some of these rarer birds are supposed to come through Texas and go on up into the Midwest and East, but they make a wrong turn, they end up over here, and then they like it and they keep coming back every year. <laughs> and then we like it a lot because we get to see them. This is one of them, definitely took a wrong turn. This is a painted red start. This is over. Uh, Where'd you see it, Benelli Park? In Benelli Park, yeah, over uh, in the east of LA. And this bird has been coming for five or six years now, and uh, he's very beautiful. And he he's in cahoots with this next bird, the uh, um, 
red-breasted um, sap sucker. He goes around the tree and drills holes in a circle to, to get the sap and the bugs, and the, the red star follows along behind him looking for bugs and ants and stuff that he's missed. If you're looking for that bird or if you're out looking on the trunk, you'll see rows of holes in circles. Then you know he's been there. There's several kinds of sap suckers. That's a yellow-headed blackbird. We've seen those at the Harbor Park, which is a good spot for birding. He looks like a regular blackbird, but, he, but if he's in, in a mixed flock with the regular big blackbirds, boy, he stands out with that yellow head. We get so used to seeing mallards all year long that we sort of lose interest in ducks, but in the migration time, like right now for water birds, uh, you have beautiful ones like this. This is a, a green-winged teal. I like the colors on his head. That's a wood duck. You often see them in parks. They look like a painting. They're just okay. unbelievably uh, beautiful. That's the end of the North American birds, and we're going to start on some of our little trips. But I wanted you to know that there are 730 different kinds of birds identified um, in North America. Everything above Mexico. Yeah. And if you add the strays, the ones that aren't supposed to be, it's up to 900. So, and Fred, remember I said tick, 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 he's a ticker. He has 612 of them, so he t he's doing very well, yes. I don't do that, so I don't know how many I have. Yes, it's, uh, it's fun to, uh, for so, you know, I'm a, I'm a lister. I put them on my computer. I look at other people, how many they have, like these friends we'll see in a minute, you know, they're listers too, and we have a lot of competition when we bird together because we're within a few birds of each other. So that part of it can be fun. Or like Donna, you just love to see the birds, the people, and the animals. So these, uh, we're going to show you a few slides from four trips we've taken in the last few years on four different con continents. This is in Panama. This is the famous uh, Canopy Tower Lodge in the, right near the canal in Panama. It was an old naval radar station, if you look at the top, and they've converted it into this birding lodge, and the, on the deck up top is a fabulous place to just stand and sit and watch uh, mm -hmm. these beautiful, colorful birds that you find when you get down in the, the tropical areas. We're looking at the part of the canal is right there. I don't know if you can see it. This was one we, it's not a very good picture, because it's a blue cotinga, it's called, and it is so bright blue that I saw one at a distance one, uh, one time and I thought somebody had put a neon light bulb up in a tree. Good friends. Met them in Costa Rica, and they live in New Jersey, and we've done five, six, seven trips with them, so you'll see them a lot. That's Rich and Ellen. In fact, they're in all... All three of the next trips we're showing you. Rich and Ellen from New Jersey, and we have a lot of fun. In fact, I've been to several trips in North America when Donna's working, just the three of us. Well, Unfortunately, a... most of the colorful birds are in the hot, hot, damp, sweaty rainforest. So we're there a lot. But the payoff for colorful birds like this golden-headed tanager that are just... <clears throat> you wonder how they evolved to have such colors like that. This is called the resplendent quetzal, which is a high target bird for people going to Panama and Costa Rica and Central America. Long, long tail feathers. That's uh, one of many toucans you find down there. It's not the <laughs> one on the cereal box, but uh, they come in all colors, sizes, and shapes. When you see them flying from tree to tree, they look like a bomber. Look they like a put javelin. their head out. And they're, it's just... they're absolutely straight profile with their legs back and their bill out. They look like a stick flying through the air. Donna likes these birds. That's a, a troga, and there are many. This one was really bright blue. You can't see it. I'm bright yellow. I called it the UCLA bird. But he was anting, and that is really spectacular. There will be these small ant mounds on the trunk of a tree, and he'll get on a branch next to it, and he'll just run up and put out his wings and bump up against this nest. Then he'll go back, and he's doing it. 
he, the ants are eating the parasites off of him. He it's wants the ants to come on to he wants his them feathers. To, mm -hmm. It's fascinating. I've only seen that once. So. This is a look at the feet. The red legs, it's called a red-legged honey creeper. They're sort of like a hummingbird, but very, very bright colors. There's a group of birds called mannequins, which we like a lot. They always have some color up around their head or neck. This is the red-capped mannequin. And uh, when we first saw him, he did a wonderful little dance, not for us, for the female he was trying to tell. He moonwalks like Michael Jackson. He walks backwards. <laughs> One leg hopping up and down the branch. Look at me. <laughs> I don't know. I did not see a female. <laughs> I no, don't know. <laughs> I don't think it worked that time. Another mannequin, the golden-throated uh, mannequin. There's probably 50 or more kinds of hummingbirds in, in Central and South America. We have about a dozen in North America, three or four or five in California. None the, anywhere else in the world. This is an emerald. Asia. Emerald capped uh, hummingbird. Beautiful birds. Yes. This was a silhouette shot I got of the appropriately named horn uh, sword billed hummingbird. So he evolved to probe into some kind of flower or plant, obviously. I, I, I marveled how he could fly around through these bushes and not <laughs> crash into something with that big bill hanging out. This one's also appropriately named the sicklebill hummingbird, and he only feeds on this one plant, that red flower thing. And it's another example of if we go in and destroy the habitat and the trees and the plants, then this bird is going to be gone too because there's, there's nothing for them to live on. Now we've changed continents. We're in Africa now. This is Namibia. It's a brand new, well, pretty new uh, country on the west side it touches South Africa Botswana Zimbabwe you we see, spent three weeks there birding it's the Atlantic coast just above uh, South Africa and it's mostly desert like this next slide you wouldn't think there'd be very many birds but there are lots of animals too saw so lots of game also this was in a, a Tosha National Park, which is a famous game park in Namibia. Giraffes. Gazelles, I think. And these, uh, these parks have water holes that they light up at night. You've, you guys, have, some of you have no doubt been in Africa, and you go out and you watch the lions come in and the, all the dangerous animals, but they want to make sure you know you're there at their, your own risk, so they... They tell that to you in three languages. This is some bright bird. You know, you, you look at the drab desert, you think, well, there's not going to be many colorful birds, but, but there are, and this is one of them. Every morning is, is great because you're in these nice lodges and you start out with coffee on a deck looking at birds flying around. This is our guide, young South African, knew, knew so much about birds. Yeah. We love the lifestyle on these trips. That's a yellow-billed hornbill, a very common bird in, uh, in the plains of Africa. My uh, favorite bird, that's a hoopoe. And uh, this one was taken, and now maybe I've seen them in South Africa. They just are in the gardens, in the, on the lawns. But what was amazing is, Years later, we went on a trip to Greece, and there's one in the ruins in Greece. So he f They migrate like migrates. the birds here. They go from Africa up into Europe and Asia uh, to breed in the uh, spring and summer. And then they go back to Africa in the fall. Can you find it? Yes. Very difficult, though. If somebody hadn't known that it was there, we'd, I, we would have never seen it. Yeah, the, the ground crew t showed us where it was or we wouldn't have found it. Do you see it? It's an owl. It's a, I don't know what Probably one. Probably a scopes owl, I think. I remember you t saying that I, one of the benefits that I get is to meet the people in the villages and the children. I always am interested in the children because I'm a teacher. And I always take a little treat 
something. And we're usually... Well, she takes a whole suitcase full of things. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, we just start talking and trying to talk, and it's so exciting. And they, I think they think we're crazy because we're looking at birds. Yeah. Donna's like a little UN going through these countries because <laughs> the kids and people always are drawn to her. And you'll see later. Well, no, I guess you won't, but she draws a crowd. Part of this trip went over into Botswana to the Okavanga Delta where we had been years before and it's a huge floodplain that every uh, fall after the rainy season it floods and of course draws all the animals and birds to that area that come in out of the desert. I mean elephants walk hundreds of miles to get to this place so it's a wonderful place to see birds and, and animals mainly from boats. At one lodge it was a nice lodge, but our quarters were sort of the overflow, I think. So we were in this tent about a quarter of a mile from the lodge. And it was fine. It was very comfortable. But we got nervous at night walking that quarter of a mile with just a flashlight down that dark, dark road <laughs> out there in the, in the boonies. Okay. Those are uh, bee eaters, carmine bee eaters. You don't want to be a bee in Southern Africa because there's <laughs> plenty of these guys that'll eat you. But there's one guy who is a visitor. Do you see him? He's facing the other way. Right here. <laughs> and they gave him room. What did they do before they had telegraph wires? That's a good point. What? I don't know what they did. They do dig in the dirt. They're on the, they nest in the, in the riverbeds on the side. They dig holes, so maybe they just stayed there. <laughs> That's probably the uh, little bee eater, that one's called. Okay, this third trip is in Alaska and Russia, and we started out in Nome, way over on the Bering Sea. Uh, and we got on a ship, about a hundred passenger ship, that uh, is, I don't know what they call them, adventure ships or something, but they're nature cruises. And uh, our group of 35 bird watchers was part of this thing. And they have these Zodiac boats. They must have a dozen of them. And they take you out on the Zodiac boats to see the wildlife or go on the islands or see birds. They're wonderful trips. And, they're, you know, not a lot of people. So it, it's a fun way to do it. Uh, of course, a lot of bird watching was done from the ship as it went through the Bering Sea. And, and they were actually throwing food and oil out into the water to attract the seabirds because we were mainly getting seabirds on this trip, which aren't very colorful, so why was I there? But it was because you can't get those birds to check them off unless you do a trip like this. So uh, We were mainly looking for albatross-type birds. They're huge. There must be six, seven-foot wingspan. They don't move their wings. They just... Over the right down in the water, and like the current, something's coming off the water. They barely uh, fly. These birds will never be on land except to nest. So they'd spend their life at sea. There's Donna and her friends practicing their albatross uh, <laughs> patterns. There's the Borzellis These again. These are our New Jersey connection. So on these foggy, cold days in July, you'd go out and all bundled up to these Aleutian Islands to look for birds. These are, uh, I think, whiskered auklets, but there are several kinds of auklets and murrelets and birds like this, and they're on the rocks and they're out in the water. <coughs> Common mirrors, they have those clear down in the probably northern California, you can see those. Puffins. Uh, there's two kinds of puffins. That's the tufted puffin, I think. And there's a third puffin in the Atlantic Ocean, which I need to get over there because I haven't been able to tick that one off. This is our guide. This is our guide. We go on these islands, and they, they can be quite rocky and plain, but this is, this is what happens. You see, the scope is set up on a, on a very good bird that maybe is far enough away you can't see it very well unless you are on the scope. So everybody lines up to look through the scope, but you only have about three seconds because the idea is to get everybody to see the bird at least once so they can count it. 
Then if there's time, you can go back and look more leisurely. And I know that Alan there on the scope has probably just run me off. And if I, she's behind me, she'll be pounding on my back after about, I barely see the bird. Okay, Fred, okay. Next. In the meantime, the guides have found other birds to look at. And so pretty soon you don't know where to point your binoculars. It was very hard walking on the gravel, and Donna caught a ride with, uh, with one of the locals. I don't know what they did before ATVs, but they have them. We woke up one morning. It had been foggy and cold, and the deck was strewn with these little guys, about this big, hundreds of them. They were in the pool. They were under the deck chairs. And apparently they had been attracted to the lights, the lights on the ship, and so they had all decided to rest, and they can't, couldn't take off, can't get out. So we the spent deck the, was wet and slippery. Yeah. So we spent the morning taking each one of these little guys, and, and off they would go. They smelled awful. But they're very interesting. They spend their life at sea. This is a leased storm petrel. See this little thing right there on his beak? That's where he can expel the salt out of the salt water, and that's how he survives. He can get the water, so he, he's not the only one. But So that was fun. There he goes. So, that's one of them. Yeah. We picked up and threw a lot of birds off. You, you just have to throw them in the air, and then they can fly. We ended up uh, over in the Kamchatka Peninsula at some Russian city, and then went up to this volcano area at the mouth of a river to look for a, a few birds. That whole peninsula over there is just full of these volcanoes, hundreds of them, beautiful. They probably have the biggest, meanest grizzly bears of anywhere. We were in the zodiacs, we were fine. Yeah, but I asked for a potty stop and I was very nervous when we pulled in there and <laughs> I had to go behind a bush for a second. I was very nervous. The main uh, bird you want to get over there is called the stellar sea eagle. He's huge. He's half again as big as our eagles that we have here. Uh, and look at the mammoth beak on, on the front of him. And then uh, that's the picture I took, but that's a better look at what he looks like. Our final continent is, was our latest trip. October last year, we went to... I think our fourth time to Australia, but the reason we were doing it is because we were going to be able to go to Papua New Guinea, which is just opening to birding, and so we were very excited about this trip. So we started out at the cassowary house. I don't even know what a cassowary is. That's where our guide is. I had never heard of a cassowary, but they're almost as big as an ostrich and much meaner, apparently. <laughs> There's one. And there's and rules about how to deal with them when you see them. It's sort of like our grizzly bear, or our bear rules at our national parks. You mainly you stay the heck away from them. They're real fast. They'll, they'll run right over you, apparently. Uh, our, our guide, actually, he owned this lodge, Cassowary House, and there's Rich and Ellen again, and they had these wonderful breakfasts with, those, see those two fruit platters? There were about six fruits there I had never had before. Fabulous, but also, how many have been to Australia? And what's the stuff they eat on their toast? Vegemite. You ever had Vegemite? Oh my gosh, it's the it's worst awful. stuff in it's the world. It's awful, right? <laughs> it's well, terrible. we told Alan, since as, as a rite of passage here, you have to try Vegemite, and this next picture shows her, her reaction to the Vegemite. Yeah, it's, it's bad. They put it on everything. You could bird watch right from the breakfast table at, on the feeders they had. This is called a, a green cat bird. And of course, when he, his call sounded like a cat. If you heard the cat, then you looked on the feeder because it was the bird. So on these trips, you go with companies. There's companies that will take you on these worldwide trips, right? And you travel around in a van usually because there's only about six people on the trip. They're expensive. <laughs> but every couple of days, you leave the lodge you're at, and you throw everything in the back of the van, and you bird your way to the next lodge. This is down in Australia. That's an Australian king parrot. They're supposed to be wild, but I think this one had been hanging around the lodge too much. 
And this was a self-portrait I took. This is a Regent Bower bird who I thought was very striking and handsome. Bower birds Donna can tell you about. This is the bower of a blue bower bird. This is the bower. And inside is where he hopes to get his mate to come. So Lure he put, her in there. He only collected blue stuff. Those are all water bottle caps and <laughs> ribbons and, you know. And he's there every day grooming it and fixing it and then hoping for somebody to come. Some bower birds will collect yellow or, you know, something totally different. But they're very uh, careful about how they do it. Now we're in New Guinea. It was the highlands of New Guinea. An hour's flight yeah. from uh, Brisbane, Australia. This is our guide. And I guess this one too, yeah. Anyway, we went to this very remote... We were in a remote lodge to begin with, and we got up at four in the morning to take this hour and a half bumpy dirt road, pot-filled ride to this little village where not many people go because I don't think they'd ever seen digital cameras. They couldn't get over these, seeing their pictures right away. Anyway, we went there to look for a, uh, one of the birds of paradise. And the thing about New Guinea is they have about 33 kinds of birds of paradise that have evolved from a crow-like bird. They look, you know, on their bodies and everything to shape, but they've evolved over the years with these gaudy colors and feathers all for sexual attraction. There's really not much there's no way of predators there. So the big thing about New Guinea is to find birds of paradise. So we did find this one. I think he's the next picture. This, believe it or not, is called the lesser bird of paradise. Oh. It's big. about the size of a pigeon, but then the tail makes it well, twice they're, they're as big. Bigger, than a, big, pigeon, bigger yeah. than a pigeon, yeah. The greater bird of paradise, the only difference was where the white is in the tail, he, the other one was all pinky red. But the, the, it was, it, that was the most beautiful bird I've ever seen. So when we got it, by the time you know, we arrived, and then, like I said, they started coming in to talk to Donna, and the, practically the whole village was there, and they were all rooting for us. And it, thumbs up everybody means we was did it. Thumbs up when we find the bird Oops. finally came in so we could see it. My favorite outfit of the day. We had stopped on the of side the of the row, and it was raining. And the bathrobe and the hard hat were perfect for the rain. <laughs> just they, they just, you know, dress whatever they can find. <laughs> we hiked up a, a very beautiful mountain trail one day to try and find the King of Saxony bird of paradise, which we did get him in the scope. Has these two beautiful feathers coming out of his head. Sometimes you'll put them way up over his head. Just another example of how varied these birds of paradise are. There's one that's just bright red. He looks like that summer tanager that we showed you earlier. That is a, um, a crested berry picker. Picture's up here, too. What's unusual about that, he normally doesn't look like that, but I looked out a window of our little hut, and uh, there he was displaying with his crest up and his chest up, he's, he's trying to attract. And he already had a nest with babies in it, so I, you know, this guy, <laughs> this was an action guy, and uh, he would just stand like that, waiting for some female to come by. I think the next picture shows what he looks like when he's not displaying. This is a totally different That's bird. That's a different bird, and I don't remember the name. But the yellow, is sometimes orange or half yellow and half orange. It tells what mood he's in is what they told us. It's sort of a, a, a featherless area on his face like vultures have where there's no feathers and they have bright colors instead. Don't know why it's there. There's a, we were down at a university in lower parts of New Guinea and uh, again the, tel the telescope thing, you, you better be quick. <coughs> Oh, and you can digitize. You can put your Digi camera scope. up to the telescope, focus it, and shoot pictures through the scope. If everybody's seen the bird and there's yeah, nobody that, in line. After the first look. This was some sort of a, a kingfisher. He actually has a tail about mm, almost a foot long. It goes down below there. Very exotic. 
And that's the last picture of the uh, lesser bird of paradise again. This time, this is what he does when he displays for a female. So that, those yeah. are the slides. And uh, we have a few little items we just like to show you real fast. Humming is a publication from the local chapter of South Bay Audubon, I do believe. It's a newsletter that we get. And I just cut out the, the trip schedule for next month and this month. We'll talk about that in a minute. But look at the other one, the beginning steps. It's organized, and again, you, most of you are probably gonna, you're gonna care less about this, but if you ever wanted to do a little more, or at least find out what it's about, these are the steps. And the first is gear you'll need. Well, one, you need a pair of binoculars. You, my rule is never go outside without your binoculars. But, uh, and you don't, you know, you can see them, I guess, with the little tiny ones you buy at Target or something, but I've, I've given some information about getting ones that'll really allow you to see the birds better. But anyway, there's two things about when you're out looking at birds in these red trees, and Don and I will show you what we mean. One is you have to, if a person can't see the bird, you have to have, help them figure out where it is, and then you have to put the binoculars up in the right way or you won't see it either. So let's pretend there's that big tree out there, Donna. Okay. And I see a, a bright yellow oriole in it. Do you see it? No. I... It's right there in that tree. I can't find it. Okay, well that's no help, right? <laughs> what you have to do is you say, okay, Donna, the edge of the tree is a clock. Go to two o'clock on the tree and come in about five feet toward the center of the tree. Okay, got it. Yes, okay, now put, now, can you find it in your binoculars? No. Well, that's because if you do this and then you go try to find the bird, you can't find it. So show Why them the I right can... way to do it. Or okay. She sees where the bird is. I see the bird. I don't move. You don't take your eyes off the bird while you put the binoculars on. Then the oh, bird will be right there. There it is. It's gorgeous. But if you put the binoculars up and try to move around finally, you can't do it. And the really good binoculars have this, which is wonderful, because I can bird with my glasses on. This is without, and then you can put them down, and then I can see. Uh, you need field guides. And those are simply picture books of the birds. Helps you identify them. However, which one you want? This is Australia. And I'm not carrying this for five hours on a jungle trail. So, what we learned from other birders is you get your guide. This was when we went to Ecuador. And we just pulled out the pictures, the plates, and put them on a ring. And this I'm willing to carry, or he is. So just little tricks. Yeah. There's also, there's also birds that are very, uh, bird guides are very local. Here's one for Southern California. And there's one out now in my National Geographic called the Birds of Los Angeles or something. I've mentioned it in here. Birds of Southern California. That's great. I mean, then you, then you don't have so much to look through to try and figure out what you're looking at. Then there's uh, the idea of if you want to list and keep track of birds with checklists, you can do that. My North American checklist has been my, my index in my bird book. And you, you, can, you just check them off over the years, and then you can transform them to the computer. This guy got left in a, on the prairie, a, we're in Missouri Prairie at a something. State Park. Man, you should have seen the emails, the phone calls, and they mailed it back to him. So we were lucky. Yeah. That would have been a disaster. Show him your iPod. Hmm? Show him this. I want you to know that you can buy bird calls for the U.S., now for all the other countries, and our daughter just did a download on her iPhone. You can download all those bird calls. So if she wants to find them, they're on her phone. It's Who's amazing. That? That yellow-breasted chat, the big warbler was the chat chat. That's an easy one. Most of them, I have no idea what they are. 
because I can't hear well anyway, but the, the, the leaders, the really good birders, that's how they bird. They walk through. They don't even look at the trees. They just wait till they hear something. Then they find it. Then you off you go to look for it. Um, we didn't it. get the magazines. Uh, oh, yeah. I'll put these oh, out. Forgot. There's there's some... Um, that Hummin has... It's a, actually a magazine. And then the place to get all this stuff is where to buy is um, Wild Birds Unlimited store down at PCH and Crenshaw. Uh, They're terrific in there. They'll Bob help Chanman you. will... Is great to help. And, and he leads bird walks down in Madrona Marsh once a month. And Mountain Byhower, who work, teaches at Chadwick, he leads tours down through Harbor Park once a month. So there's lots out there if you want to do it. And mean? he'll help you with binoculars or anything, although you can buy a lot of this stuff on uh, the Internet, too. Amazon.com, we get it all. Yeah. And the best times to bird watch, I've already said that late April and, er and most of May is a wonderful time, the colorful bird. And by summer, there's nothing colorful left except the blue scrub jays or something. But this time of year is great for water birds. You know, if you go to any lake or park with, with uh, ducks and stuff, uh, they're all here now. And then finally, on the back of that, it's the, the steps you can take. And the first, if you wanted to ever try this, the what you have to do is use that other list and show up at one of those bird walks because the experts are there and you just follow the group, join the group, and they take you around, they find the birds, they get you on the bird, they tell you what it is, they'll even find it in your guide for you. <laughs> and then once you get comfortable doing that, you can go to these festivals or stuff Don and I talk about, which are pretty cheap. And then you can go out on your own. And there's a whole book on a birder's guide to Cali Southern California that has a peninsula chapter in it that Martin Byhauer from um, Chadwick School wrote uh, that has all the places. I don't know if he mentioned your coral trees, but he should have probably. And then finally, for the international trips, there's these tour companies that you go online and sign up and show up and take these expensive trips that are, that are priceless. I have to share one story that I'll never forget. It was probably our first birding trip to Africa, and we were in the Okavango Delta, and we were in one of these dugouts, you know. And they assign you a, a local guide for your week, and we're paddling, and we heard something. He said to us, page 34. <laughs> he, knew, he couldn't speak English, but he knew that bird was on page 34 of the guide. I mean, that is absolutely amazing. They're wonderful. So, uh, my gift to you is birding, if you so choose. Our gift to you is birding. Uh, you never know what's out there. Look up, look down, listen, and you might find something really spectacular. So, um, now you'll at least be aware, and we appreciate you having us. Thank you so much. The question was, he saw a lot of robins uh, back east, but he hasn't seen many in California. And that's mainly a function you don't see very many around the ocean line, the peninsula area. They like the forests and the cold. The question is, do all birds migrate? No. A lot of these mallards, ducks, I think, just stay here year-round. But most do. The, the really pretty ones do, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and they... You know, there are birds, there's a hawk and, and then a little dick thistle bird. They go from Canada or here. You know where they end up every winter? We're talking in, about this bird. In Argentina. And then they come all the way back. It's just amazing. Even most, you know the red-tailed hawk, which is the one you see the most, you see? They even leave. So, uh, not all of them, but most of them are going to South America. Or Mexico. Mm -hmm. She wants to know if uh, the sapsuckers are related to the woodpeckers. Uh, and the answer is yes. They're in the same part of the guide. They're like, a, I guess, a subspecies of uh, woodpeckers. Oh. Oh. What, you what, could look in our book. What do you recall about yours? What color did it? <laughs> Red on top, and he had some black and white. And I looked him up, and I thought, well, he's a woodpecker, but it wasn't clear as to which species he was. 
A lot of them look very much alike, those woodpeckers, anyway. Yeah. yeah. I didn't have binoculars yeah. well, at the moment, so I didn't know. Come up after, or we'll find them for you. And also, what's the ratio you use for hummingbird feeders for sugar and water? Because well, sometimes I make it, and the hummingbirds don't come. Well, how much sugar and water do you put in your feeders? I've been using one sugar to four water. That is correct. That's what most of them say. Could you repeat the question? Oh. She wants to know, if you make hummingbird feeders, how much sugar do you put versus the water? And part of the answer here is we have been uh, wonderfully, unbelievably unsuccessful at hummingbird feeders. They won't come no matter what I do. Mm. We live right up here we probably, by have, we probably have too many flowers and stuff. We have planted purposely a lot of trumpet red, yellow, so we just don't feed them anymore. They, they're all over. Yes. Mm -hmm. I read somewhere advice not to provide hummingbird feeders because that sugar water becomes uh, fermented. It yes, can, you yeah. might if you're going. So put out flowers. And you have to be careful feeding birds. And Martin Byhauer, he's the local guru down at Chadwick School, and he has a big thing about. And somebody here told me they do it, and I have, well, I've done it before. Will you take the bread and stuff down to the park and feed the ducks? They're, they're very uh, against that for uh, various reasons. But if you're going to feed the hummers, you have got to clean it every three to four days. You'll see mold starting. You're hurting the birds. Oh, I just give them flowers. That's what there we do. There you go. How do you get rid of the crows? <laughs> What's the question? How, do, the question? How, how do you get rid of the crows? Uh, you don't. As far as I know, you can try to, you know, they come to our feeders. They knock food out and they're on the ground and we just leave them be. You can't poison them, you'll kill all the other birds. Yeah. Uh, they are just very good at adapting to, yeah. Well, we don't have much problem with them because I don't think they like the little seeds and stuff we give our birds, but someone else here was saying they eat all the cat food because she feeds cats. Well, there you go. There you go. They're going to they're gonna eat that. I understand that uh, different kinds of uh, growth attract uh, birds. Uh, birds of a particular type. And there's, in some bird watching societies, they have a list of these, what you should plant in your yard right. in accordance with what you want to attract. Exactly yes. right. Do you, do you have such information, uh, or is it available for the local area? You'll see in there we've listed some magazines you can look at, uh, go online, or like Birders World or Wild Bird. They always have articles like that in there. Could you explain that question? The okay. question was, uh, you know, what kind of plants should you plant to attract various kinds of birds? And the answer is these, these popular birding magazines will have articles like that all the time. There are spectacular pictures in these bird magazines, too. We, we forgot them. I'm sorry. I love Wild Bird. I love Birds in Bloom. Audubon has one. There's about five, six you can subscribe to if you want to. Just Google bird watching magazines. And... Uh, Speaking of birds in bloom, I find that the leaders, particularly these ones who really know what they're doing, they are also very good at botany. They're, they know the plants, and they're very good at butterflies. They all know the butterflies because they know what attracts what. Where and all look. the animals you see. Yeah. So uh, if you weren't interested in birds, you would get the other part if you went on one of these walks. And you can't be too old. There's a, it was a Japanese, you know, he's an American for a long time, but he doesn't speak English very well. I don't know how he got by, but he was a doctor in the East for years. He's in his late 80s. He and his wife goes on these trips, and he'll sit in the van with his big old camera and just shoot pictures out the window. He can't walk very well, so when we go hiking, he'll just get sit on his stool out under a tree and take pictures of birds that come by. So Everybody's welcome. No excuses. Could you talk a little bit about seed and how we... We put out seed, but we get sort of the standard, the wrens and the bluebirds. The, Is there any way to expand the uh, color that we can attract? What can you put out to uh, expand the colorful birds that you get? You know, that is a problem because we put out these seeds and 95% of the birds we get are the um, house finch. Right? And sparrows. And blue jays. And blue jays. And scrub jays, yeah. Not blue jays, scrub jays. 
Well, but now we hang corn on a chain, and the dried the, corn. The jays love that, and the squirrels. It keeps the squirrels off our feeder. They go over there. But when we feed, there's a lot of loss. If you buy feed at the grocery store, you're going to lose a, a lot of it. It's going to go on the ground. The birds don't want it. We take make the extra effort to buy. Uh, we call it no mess. You can buy it down there. So that everything in there is for Edible. one kind of bird or another. See, some birds will go to your feeders. You'll see others on the ground. That's where they feed. So you want it to fall down for those other birds. Somebody was talking about the juncos have just been coming through, the little Oregon juncos. The blackhead, gray And body. they travel with the uh, white-crowned sparrows. They're always on the ground. So it, they feed at different levels, too, so you have to hang things at different levels. Okay, but here's the answer to your question about the birds I was showing you. Most of those don't come to feeders. They're all... They're not seeders. They're, those warblers are all gleaners. You got your red, your coral trees out here. That's where they're going to be. And the orioles and the, the beautiful tanager, they're just not going to get those at feeders. So you have to know where these places are, where they congregate, and that's why in uh, April, May, take those bird walks with the experts, and pretty soon you'll know where all this stuff is. But once in a while, I hear something that's different, and I look out the window, or I look at my feeder, and there's a great bird. Oh, but they're few and rim. far between. We have, every once in a while, a flock of them very similar to that just lean mm. off of the... Yeah. Yeah, they just go right on through, and then they go away. What are they? I haven't found them in the bush. Okay, her, co her question is, there's a small little, and they're noisy, comes through, you hear them. They're very small, they're in groups, they hit your trees, and off they are. Yeah. They are bush tits. Yeah. Oh, okay. You can, look. you can hear them coming. They're little gray birds, very tiny. And sweet and little thing, and very nondescript. Bush tits. Yeah, right. They're buggy. They're getting bugged. Yeah. See, you guys are watching birds. <laughs> Thank you for watching Peninsula Senior Lecture Series. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.